أفلح من صلى على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من شر الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد respected scholars elders brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته shall a continuation from yesterday night's topic with the limited time the time given I'd like to discuss in a more elaborate manner, the effect of people's actions. And a special reference to Bahlul tonight, a special reference to Imam Hassan alayhi afdal salati wa salam, in which we celebrate his birthday yesterday, inshallah, continuing it today, as the banner is still behind me. So we'll discuss his actions and how it may have an impact, or one of the impacts that actions are very important to have in the society in which we live in. Now, Ali ibn Abi Talib starts off, by, starts off the topic tonight by referring to his statement which he suggests. And he says that knowledge will be guarding us. Knowledge protects us. And when he compares it with money or wealth, he says, however, on the flip side, we are the ones that protect and guard our wealth. Knowledge throughout time increases. Whereas wealth, you see, as time progresses, will be used up. And he says it will deteriorate within the years, whereas knowledge will increase through the years. And it has much more application. Now, when we look at the concept of knowledge, and we looked at it yesterday, and we said to ourselves, knowledge is not a determining factor. The determining factor, which is of the utmost importance, is the actions or what we act based on our knowledge. And we refer to all the a'mal that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs from us from the worshipping, from the transactions, and how we have such a greater rank or a greater reward if we have the concept of knowledge, ma'rifah. Why is it we do a particular thing? Why we act in a certain manner? Not just doing it because we were told. And that's one of the main faculties that differentiates our school of thought than any other school of thought, as we've said throughout the lectures in which we've stated that one particular school of thought does as they're told. However, the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt, we have to question everything prior to doing it, prior to emerging ourselves in that particular act of worship, whether it be hijab, whether it be for the male or the female, whether it be salah, siyam, anything, any action, we can look at why is it that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the mannerisms in which we worship. Now let's look at a'mal. The application of a'mal. We referred yesterday to the moral characteristics of Imam Hassan alayhi afdal salati was salam, in which a man came, cursed Imam Hassan, and the particular action that Imam Hassan replied with, in which brought someone towards the religion of Islam. Now we know from our Imams the moral characteristics. We have another moral characteristics of Imam Zain al Abidin. In which this one will honestly make you really determine now in our days how much someone can take. Imam Zain al-Abidin lived through many timelines of the Khulafa. One in particular was by the name of Hisham ibn Ismail or Hisham ibn Ismail. Hisham, when he was depositioned, he was tied to the streets. And the Khalifa of the time says, anyone that wants anything from this particular person. Come and take it from him. As you know, a Khalifa of the time, he oppressed, he took, he gifted as he wished, corruption within the land. So there's many people that had hatred towards him, were, inf were infected, their families affected as well by particular actions that this man did. So you find, look at this man, and look at how much he has hurt the Ahlul Bayt. This man is replied by saying, I fear no one except Ali, son of Hussein. So you can imagine, as a dictator, how much he must have affected the family 
of the Prophet, how much he affected the life of Imam Zain al Abidin. Not just in a direct manner, he would tell people to go and make sure that their life or their living circumstances were very troubled. Whether they be in the streets, they'd curse them in the streets, whether they inflict damage, whether it would be mental, physical, they would hurt them in one way or another. So he comes forth and he says, I'm not scared of anyone except Ali Zain al Abidin, Ali son of Hussein. Now the companions hear about this and they say to Imam Zain al Abidin, Well, this is your chance. This is a time where you can go and, you know what, take our revenge. So Imam Zain al Abidin says, Come with me. He says, Come with me. He goes to, towards Husham al Ismail. He's, in, he's tied down in the marketplace. Everyone's coming and you find everyone throwing stuff at him and cursing him and showing their hatred towards him. Imam Zain Abidin comes and you can imagine that person, the only person he's scared of, Imam Zain Abidin. And he gets closer and closer and he trembles more and more. He goes up to him and he whispers. Look at the beauty of this. He whispers to him. He says, you know who I am. He says, of course. He says, you know what you have done? Alaikum <laughs> salam He says, you know what you've done towards me and my family? He says, yes. He says, let me ask you another question. He says, what is it? He says, do you need anything? He says, excuse me? He says, is there anything that you need? An outstanding debt? Do you want food? Do you want water? Is there anything I can help you with? That's the Imam's reply to a person that's oppressed him for so long. The Sheikh narrates to us the characteristics of the Prophet, where a Jewish man, day in and day out, he would attack the Prophet, put feces on the Prophet, make sure his traveling was troublesome. One, one day, two days, three days pass, the Prophet doesn't see this Jewish man, and he begins to ask, where is this Jewish man? The person that's hurt you, O Prophet of Islam, says, yes, the person that's always causing us trouble. He says, he's sick. He says, let's go to him. Which one, which one of us would do that? If a friend hasn't kept in contact with us, you know, he's thinking, you know, what is, doesn't matter about him. He hasn't replied to my messages or, you know, he doesn't keep in contact. If he really wanted to see me, he would message me. Taking it, the burden off our shoulders. However, Islam tells us you have to go and join relations. You have to go towards the mu'mineen. You have to make sure that you see what they want and provide for them. So the Prophet asks around and he says, where is this Jewish man? He says, that's his house. He goes towards his house. So the person, look at this, this Jewish man that's attacked the Prophet. He sees the man entering. He sees the Prophet of Islam entering. He begins to fix himself. He says, the Prophet of Islam visiting me? He says, yes. He says, why? He says, you're sick. Islam teaches us when someone is sick, we come and visit them. I said, so the person is embarrassed. The Prophet takes his head, puts it on his lap. He dies on the Prophet's lap. This Jewish man dies on the Prophet's lap. Saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. So many stories we have. We have an ocean of stories when we look at the moral ethics of the Imams, of the Prophet of Islam. The Prophet that he himself and the Quran states he was not sent except a mercy for mankind. The Prophet himself says, I was not sent, I was not revealed except to perfect, to perfect the morals and mannerisms of mankind. Let's look at Islam, your actions. The Prophet came to perfect our moral standings. So be sure if we have a foul tongue, make sure that's not what the Prophet taught. Make sure if we have a foul tongue, the Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman will not look at us twice. Look at the way we act. We have the knowledge. Let's imply it. Let's put it into practice. Let's make sure that when someone looks at us, he says that's a follower of the school of thought of Jafar al -Sad. Let's make sure. That's knowledge. The comparison tonight was in favor of wealth. Now we know wealth doesn't buy us happiness. And we have this idea, and, and everyone knows this idea. It doesn't, doesn't affect our happiness whatsoever. As in how many people do we know that are the richest of people, but they don't know what to do with their money. They live miserable lives. 
How many people do we know on the opposite agenda? They're rich, but they give khums. They build centers. They give towards the poor. They give charity. Look how happy they are. But to give you an example, there's, both, there's part of both worlds. You have the people that have money, don't know what to do with it. Other people, they're blessed, and they bless the people around them. Giving charity, giving from what they have. And the beautiful thing is the people that don't have, when they give, look how much of a reward that is in the eyes of Allah. Because the difference when Allah's given you, He's given you, let's say, for example, $1,000. You don't need $1,000 this week. He's given it to you. It's a difference when that person takes $10 of that $1,000 and gives it away. Whereas if a person, all he has during that week to provide is $100 and he gives $10 from that. See the difference? Big difference. Someone surviving of this, someone doesn't even need it. And you'll be given, obviously, in reference to this particular act and how much you give from what you are given and Allah will provide because charity <laughs> you're going into business with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not a normal person Allah says give I will give you ten folds come to me I will come ten steps if you take one step that's the idea that he gives us now the idea of wealth is very simple we know that and then we said this I think three nights ago when the comparison between Sulaiman which we can no one can say that someone has a bigger kingdom than Sulaiman from the people that start till the end of time, no one will have a kingdom like Sulaiman. No one will have an option which he controls jinn, ants, talks every language, has the wind under his command. No one will have that kingdom. But look at the flip side. What's the flip side? Sayyidah Fatima once goes to the Prophet of Islam and she says, I want a ring. A ring. He says, not a problem. He taught her a particular prayer. He says, after you finish this prayer, open your prayer mat on the right-hand side, you'll find a ring. So she prays the particular prayer that the Prophet taught her. Opens the prayer mat and there's the ring. In the dream that night, she sees a castle in a beautiful garden. She, see, she goes into the castle, many rooms. She says, I entered the room, there was a table that had three feet. Not four, had three feet, and it was wobbly. She goes and tells the Prophet of Islam, she says, I saw this dream. What does it mean? The Prophet says, see that ring that you got in the dunya? She says, yes. He says, that's taken away from your akhirah. He says, how? He says, you've asked for this. So it's taken away. Reference points. That's why we have that Sulaiman in our narrations will be the last Prophet out of the Prophet to enter paradise not because there's something against Sulaiman, no. But he will have a longer time being questioned for all that which he had. As in Bahlul give us, gives us this example. When Harun was drunk and looks at Bahlul and says, Bahlul, will you tell me about the Day of Judgment? And this is a lesson for us tonight, inshallah. I've just got the signal <laughs> to go down, but he gives us this example. And inshallah, we can end on this note. He asks Bahlul, he says, tell me about the Day of Judgment. How will it be like? Bahlul says, not a problem. Get a pot and I need you to light a fire under it. So Harun's king, he makes one si sign and people have it ready for him. He says, now teach me about the Day of Judgment. Bahlul, he had a walking stick and he had some ragged clothes. He jumps on. Look at what he says. Look at what he says. He says, my name is Bahlul. I own these garments... I have this walking stick or broom at the time, and he jumps off. That's all he said. He says, your turn. So Harun, he's drunk, he gets on. Whilst he's on, he says, my name is Harun. I own this clothes. And he begins to, he says a couple of things. I own this much cattle, this much wealth. He jumps straight away, off. Didn't last. Bahlul looks at him and says, hold on, Harun, you forgot such and such palace. Such and such land, such and such cattle. He says, you could not bear that particular heat. He says, what about the one thing that you've taken that's not yours? He says, what is it? He says, that chair that you sit on. The Khilafah of Ahl al-Bayt. When Harun went away from his, from his throne for a couple of seconds, Bahlul sat on it. And then when Harun returns, he's whipped. Bahlul is whipped and whipped and whipped. And he starts to cry and cry. 
And then Harun asks him, he says, why is it that you cry, Bahlul? He says, <laughs> look at the reply of Bahlul. He says, I've sat on a throne which is not mine for seconds. I was beaten like this. He says, look at you, you've sat on the throne all your life and it's not yours. This is the throne of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. How do you think your judgment will be on the day of judgment? Inshallah, we end on this. But to give us an idea tonight and just to wrap it up, we talked about knowledge. It's application, very brief instance, but we looked at more importantly, wealth and how it does not buy happiness. It's what you do with what you have. When you pray for Allah for rizq, 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 it's not just wealth. It's health. It's tawfiq. It's husn al-aqibah. It's much more than this material item that will always diminish. We have to remember this, brothers and sisters. So we pray to Allah on this note that He may provide sustenance, rizq, for each and every one of us, each and every one of the mu'mineen and mu'minat. Barakat al-salat al-mubarakat al-fatiha. Tasbiqah al-salat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.